guys, M12 Warthog here. I am back with another video, and today, in Strategy Guide, we're gonna ask and talk about a question rather than show you a tip on, rather than show you a guide on how to actually guide yourself through a strategic scenario in a video game and talk about a much bigger question. What is a strategy and more specifically, like, how do you make a strategy and what constitutes as a good strategy? Now, this question has multiple answers and it varies depending upon many different things because what could be a good scenario in one situation may not necessarily be a good scenario in another. For an example, sometimes expanding a lot early on in this game of Age of Conquest 4 seems like a good idea, but in other games it may not be, as you are very limited by how many troops you can actually afford to defend your territories, such as another good example would be Risk Factions, which is something you don't necessarily want to spread out as much, but when you do expand, you want to expand to make sure you have as little border territories as possible. So the amount of territories you have versus how many they have doesn't really matter so long as you have less territories that you border. Because if you have four long territories that span one line down the middle of the map and you own half the map, you only need to arm those four territories because those are the only ones that can even attack. But don't bother arming your capital and all that stuff. Is is makes sense as well. But, but when I look up and think about what a, specifically what a strategy is. It's a type of maneuver or tactic in my opinion that you always try to use to get a better benefit for yourself on the battlefield. Now, there are many different types of things you would constitute as a strategy that other people would not necessarily count as a strategy as well. Sometimes people see that Sometimes people say that um, setting up, doing one specific action is a good strategical move, but that doesn't necessarily mean it plays as part of your strategy as a whole, but more or less something that you do to prep for um, a big strategy move or strategic move that you're going to pull off in the end of a said battle and so forth. So it is a good strategy here that knowing that even that it is possible for me to be attacked on the coastlines even though that node's at war with me it's a, I would say that that would be a good strategy to say you know arm that territory arm those territories that have any chance of being attacked even though that they're not likely to do so early on kind of ironic this nation here Akinor just declared war on me for no reason and I honestly do not know why but what I do know is that we can expand a little bit more, I think, and, you know, make a bigger nation here. But is that necessarily the best thing to do? Because that means you expand, and when you expand, you expand into borders with other nations and all that stuff. So when you, when, when you compose a strategy... I believe it's not necessarily the best thing to do is just to only pay attention to what benefits you because what benefits you may not benefit someone else and they may react to that in a negative way, hence declare war on me. I don't know why Ekwondor did that when they're down there and I'm up here and I'm just moving all these around. Maybe it has to do with the fact that I'm in first right now, although... There are many other nations that are pretty close, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying I'm the best right now, but it is a close race first, especially when you play and you're like this early on in a game. You have limits to stuff, I'm more limited by my moves here. So when constituting, or what constitutes as another aspect of the strategy, is you gotta focus on every single possibility. If I move here, will they move there after me and pretty much attack the same territory as me? Or will they see, oh, I, oh, they were here first, let them have this? It really, in the end, you're not really going to know what your enemy can 
what your enemies or your opponents are going to do or what other people in the strategic scenario that aren't necessarily your enemies nor your allies are going to do anyway as well. Sometimes people will think that while well, just attacking everyone and destroying everyone in your way is would constitute as a good idea. But is it really? Because I could do that here. And that'd be kind of hard if I were to declare war on everyone right now, which I can't do because there's no way I'd have enough action points for it. Sometimes people start out like that, it, or, or some people are thrown into a situation like that, and they really can't do anything about it. A good example would be the Attack of the Barbarian scenario, where if you play as the Huns, you start out with every single nation at war with you. Not surprising, but it's actually kind of accurate, because when they came in to Europe, they tried to conquer everything. And don't get me wrong, their archers were pretty good, especially the ones on horseback. It's just that everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes people fail to see what those are or fail to make use of their strengths while still preventing people from making uh, use of, uh, of their unit's weaknesses as well. Another good example would be would be the misuse of units such as when Napoleon Bonaparte led his army in the Napoleonic Wars and necessarily thought that maybe we could have a a new version of Calvary that would that would take on a role that it wasn't necessarily designed to do and some people weren't too happy about uh, the Dragoons as a unit as a whole because that really those units really didn't do they weren't really used as well as they thought of, but um, in that scenario, they were made use of the best as they could, as Napoleon would always fight on a battlefield where he would have earthworks on defense or on some sort of attack where he could rely on the earth around him, trenches, other things, hills to use for his own defense. At that time, having the high ground and stuff like that came is a big part of a strategy and pretty much sometimes could be the determining factor in winning a battle. Although, during that time period, they didn't have airstrikes, nukes, bombers, or fighters that could easily take out a bunch of people on top of a hill and then have your guys charge up it. And that wasn't necessarily a thing that they had back during his time as well, either. So... What changes the what what? So now we're gonna now that we sort of clarified what what thing what capabilities certain strategies are capable of doing. Why do people choose the strategies that they do? Like what what makes me, for an example, what makes me as a as a strategist or someone or non-strategist who plays a strategy game make the decisions I've been making so far? Well. I know my goals are to attack a target that I that um, or anyone who decides to become my target try to expand as to a big ex nation as possible. Um, you know, uh, many other things. But what do I? Th but what? Because just because I think that that is good doesn't necessarily mean it's good for everyone else. You know, maybe the maybe this nation down here that has a navy. Cuba will try to not necessarily go and attack every single territory, but attack just the leader, knowing that in the domination victory terms for this game res would result in you getting every territory they own without actually having to fight it. Maybe that's why they want to do that. Maybe to prevent that from happening, some people prefer to try and put all of their units or try to focus all of their units onto the border area. And sometimes, maybe even the coastlines, because those can be attacked, although it's more often than not, you should know if someone does decide to attack you there. So, now that we've answered another part of the question as to just because someone else thinks it's good doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you, because there could be a whole string of things that you could do.
That would not make sense either way, as well. Okay. Such as, like, it, it would make sense for me to expand from here to here, which I've ordered these units to do into the territory of San Francisco, because it would limit the amount of borders that I would have with Mexico as they expand up to here, if they were able to do that and cut them off. It's a way to limit what my what my um, what my neutral what my neutral opposers, as I will call them, because they are not necessarily an ally nor an enemy, will do. So if the time comes when they do decide to attack me, I'll have something. I'll I'll have somewhat an advantage or done something that would have affected them years and years ago. Okay. So, as you guys can see here, I'm sort of limited on my land borders now that they got this and I can't really expand up into here, but I could sort of race them all the way up here if I wanted to. So, another thing that we have to focus on here, along with where I'm limited, and what I'm limited of doing is what also is the enemy limited on and what are they limited on and what their um, cap and what capabilities does that limit them to. For an example, some people in the American Civil War, I'm saying American because I'm pretty sure many other nations around the world have had their own, just for the sake of clarification, it was known as some of the reasons why I fought over it were pretty controversial, but I will say, on a, most people will say that that it started over um certain topics like slavery and whatnot. But in the case of uh the answer that that uh, people would want me to give on a New York State Regents exam, which would be over states' rights to even to have slavery or not. Not necessarily slavery, but the right to have it in a said state. Now, now what that has to do with um, strategies is is also a fact, and why that affects the strategy, or what it also has to do, has to affect with the capabilities of um of uh, what you're going to do. Why are you going to do this? Well, I'm doing it because I'm fighting for this reason. What's the best way to protect it? Because the best way to protect something in order to find that out is just not, is you have to figure out what you're fighting for, what you're doing, what your main objective is, and sometimes your objective may not just be to take out a target, but to ensure that while you started fighting in the first place, you can still do whatever you were fighting for in the first place. For an example, as the Civil War, as we're going back to this, it was mentioned I, I, what I've learned and what was mentioned in my history class is that people will say that people will say that um that the North won. Some people still believe that it could still be an ongoing thing. The South could rise again soon. Who knows? That that the war was in the past. What happened has happened. We cannot change anything. But what I do know is that. Many people would have said that um, the South and their troops were far more trained and far more better in in terms of uh, combat the, and had better leadership. One of the things we had troubles with was leadership ourselves as we had as we had as we had seven different commanders and eight different commands. One of them was given a second chance. means is that if one person necessarily does something and doesn't work then that doesn't necessarily mean that they're automatically bad it's just that maybe the strategy that they deployed for a said scenario did not work as a matter of fact the battle of bull run or the uh not and uh there are many other battles um as an example that were pretty much done twice not like some battles were done twice where they tried to do the exact same thing over again, but failed. 
sometimes they sometimes they try to do something similar to what they did and the enemy caught on and easily countered it it's kind of uh kind of confusing it after a while if you look at too many of this stuff and you're not familiar with what I'm trying to say but in a general generally in a general term that I'm gonna use to not confuse people that sometimes battles can be what people do in battles can be done over and over again because they think it will work or eventually they think it will work as an example France and Britain were engaged in what was known as the hundred years war years and years ago now, for a time being, France hired a lot of mercenaries with crossbows and they thought that that would work and that they would be able to take out their enemies using this tactic of just having their front lines be crossbowmen. It kind of makes sense because during the medieval ages and late medieval ages and all that time, people mainly for, for, for weapons, they used, they were using, um, they were using halberds if you're on horseback or maces because those could... Those could hurt soldiers, despite the fact that they're wearing plate steel armor and swords could not do that. But one of the main things that they thought would work was the crossbows. And that's what I want to focus on for this section of the uh, talking about. Crossbows are pretty good at penetration and could definitely penetrate the armor. The only problem is, is that they don't have a long range. Now, one of the things that affects tactics is sometimes what you believe is right and what is not right. Sometimes it doesn't affect, or sometimes what, what people's morals doesn't really justify their actions or affect their actions in terms of what strategy to use. For me, if I, and, and, and for um, people of France necessarily in this back during the time period, didn't like the idea of using a crossbow. They believe it gave someone an unfair advantage. They believe to fight on fair terms, shall we call it. And that was something that they really wanted to do because sometimes for some people, they believe that it was that that, that they could only do that because they thought it was fair, because other people said so, or maybe because their own set of beliefs told them that that was the right thing. And well, you know, in their opinion, they may not necessarily be wrong in the situation. They're definitely not if they just refuse not to use something. I mean, the choice is up to them. That's a choice. It's like me saying, do I want to have peanut butter and jelly? sandwich or do I want to have a ham and cheese sandwich? Now, not necessarily, both are not necessarily bad for me, but none of them are, like, super healthy, but, um, there are both options that I wouldn't mind having, as I'm not allergic to anything in either of them, and I definitely know that, um, I wouldn't gag or regurgitate because they're not as, they're not very bad, in my opinion, although that could differ from someone else as well. But, getting back to the point, they refused to use this weapon, and because of that, they were losing for the first 100 years. The 100 Years War actually went on for about 20 more years than 100 years, and around the 100 year mark is when they decided, thanks to the help of some people, like Joan of Arc, decided to help them and actually win a battle, and ultimately, ultimately they decided to fight on for Joan of Arc despite the fact that she only led one led one charge and it really re and what reignited their um will to fight for france was the fact that um she was killed over witchery which is what they call because she said she was believed to be messaged by um some sort of saint that that she could actually save her people now whether or not that part's true we don't know because there's really no way to accurately detect if someone if someone says that, uh, some sort of spirit or that um, some god that they believe in talk to them because they could say that but um and they and they are more than welcome to believe whatever they want i'm not saying that it's a bad thing but back then like people some people actually believed in that stuff some people didn't and when they didn't believe in that they they just they just did something like said you were a witch hanged you and all that stuff so you got to 
So, ultimately that's what happened, but not just what you have available, your logistics or other things, but reasons why you're fighting for may not just be reasons why you're fighting for, or it could be something you're fighting for as well. That could sort of affect how well strategies in battles are conducted. Another good example would be Joseph Stalin, who was the leader of Russia during World War II. Now, from what I've learned in history, and what they teach in Russia, I've learned is very different, because most of the fighting in World War II was done by them. They did a great job doing what they were supposed to do. We were allies, we helped each other, I guess to some extent. We sent them supplies sometimes. Um, but we didn't really... Where their border was and our borders, we necessarily didn't fight along together. Well, we definitely weren't going to turn a blind eye to um, a wounded ally of ours anyway. Is the way is the way I viewed it in the way that I've learned. So, we originally started out sending supplies to all of our allies before we actually joined in the fighting. But... But the main thing that Joseph did, aside from just receive support from us, is he decided to not let civilians leave cities as he believed that the people that you are fighting for are right here in front of your eyes and they will die unless you do the best that you can to help fight and protect them. Though, we, though for some it may have affected some and may have caused them to fight better, they ultimately ended up with the most amount of civilian casualties according to casualty reports that uh, that I was shown in history class as well. Be that as it may, I'm not saying that is a wrong strategy, but they... I'm not saying that's a wrong strategy, of course, but they were on the winning side of the war anyway. So at the very least, you can see that there are more aspects than just what your military is capable of and what your enemy is capable of and what you think they're going to be doing. So, at this point, I'd like to tell you guys that there could be multiple factors, and sometimes some that take you even by surprise, that you can never possibly account for. You can never be 100% sure what's going to happen accurately. Sometimes in this game, I'll have happiness randomly go up or down. Sometimes it goes down when I'm already um, low enough to the point where... It's getting close to someone rebelling, and then I have to spend a bunch of money sp spreading and distributing coins so people don't feel so ticked off, and then they're like, hey, the government's actually helping us now, kind of deal. And don't get me wrong, strategies can be applied to multiple different things. Like, what's the most strategic way to get a task done faster? It may not necessarily be involving... That task may not necessarily be wiping out your enemies in a strategic um, game of uh, Age of Conquest, but, but you know, that's just currently what I'm doing now. So, as a result of many things that have gone on throughout history, we can tell that not every strategy is going to be perfect. Napoleon in the Napoleonic Wars thought outnumbering at the point of attack would be the best strategy because it doesn't because he knew he didn't have a large army and he knew overall he's not going to have a larger army whatsoever but he knew that if he had a better he knew that if he had a better um if he had like he didn't need anything better, he thought, because his strategies were perfect. He even ran into some other military officers that he quoted as to be better than him. And you want to know what? That may be true in certain scenarios. The tactics that that other officer could use might be, in the tactics that he excel at using and making use of, may be the exact kind of strategies that would be needed to counter Napoleon. Then again, the then again, Napoleon's right hand man or one of his field marshals or generals could have ex excelled at making use of strategies that could counter that other officer. So when we think about it, 
Not everything can be like 100% immune to anything. Eventually, someone will find a weakness in your strategy, which is why I always spend a lot of time trying to tweak and develop other strategies. That way, I play a strategy, and if I know someone does this and starts countering it, I know, boom, exactly what to do because I practiced and accelerated at it before. Okay, now everyone's just declaring war on me. Okay, that... What the fudge? I'm like, literally... Okay, what the fudge? Okay, I need to start getting allies. And that's another thing that I want to bring up. Allies. Will they necessarily help you? Why do people help others in military scenarios? Such as World War II is a good example because there's mainly the Axis powered and the Allied powered. Allies formed together because they knew that there was a necessary evil that needed to be stopped. And they were willing to set aside differences, which is a good example of people who have a common enemy work together. Although you could say that about um, um, Hitler as he um, tried to unite people as one against the common enemy and blamed people and started his whole Holocaust World War II thing. But you know, if you think about it and look at history, France and Britain have fought each other a lot. They fought each other in what we call the Seven Years' War, despite the fact that it being longer than seven years, we fought against each other in many things, such as the Hundred Years' War, they fought against each other in other things over colonies, when, when that time period was around, where they where their age imperialism trying to get as many colonies as they can for them, or what would be their version of it. And so, necessarily, in the end, you necessarily can't guarantee that your strategy will work. But you can sort of take a guess as to, this is the best thing that I can do now, and sort of and sort of stay on top of it and sort of focus on what will work or what will not work. Hmm. And so forth. Which is not necessarily a bad thing if you think about it because your enemies and your allies have to do the same thing as well. But also on another note, when focusing on what you have to do and what your allies have to do in regards to why they help each other out is that if they find a common goal, they'll only fight and help as long as it benefits them. If they have a common goal, and once that goal is done, they may not necessarily want to help you, but maybe if they want to feel like that after the beating that all of us took, that maybe it's better to strengthen our ties and friendship between each other would be a good thing as well. Because... Many nations have had a history of fighting each other in the past. Just to prove that one's better than the other, there could be multiple different reasons. But as it stands now, some of those nations are actually allies with each other. And so forth. Now, that may not necessarily be true for video games because people will hold grudges and whatnot and so forth. Like, oh, I hate this person for doing this. But if you think about it, nowadays... Some, in many nations, we have um, proper ways of changing leadership. Where I'm from, I'm from the U.S. right now, around the time this is being recorded. It's around election day, near around there. It may be a day after, maybe a few days before that, depending upon what day this video gets uploaded. And we have several candidates to choose from. And that's how we peacefully change power. So the pers the previous person who was in charge may have hated a country, hate their guts, hate their leader, hate whatever they wanted, but the new leader may not. The new leader might want to be allies with the allies with the one person that the previous um, leader hated, and that's not necessarily going for all countries. I'm saying that goes applies to everyone, and I'm not necessarily saying that about our current leader of our nation, or well, I guess it wouldn't be fair to say leader as we don't really have a one single person who leads our country, but the person who represent is representative as a figurehead for our nation as a whole would be referring to the president, but, you know, 
I'm not really one to talk about that, but um, sometimes strategies and politics do have a line that gets blurred. So what you do necessarily as a leader of a nation versus a general can also affect your strategies. Now I'm going to go back to World War II for this reference, as I'm going to refer to Hitler and what he did to weaken his own army. During the Battle of the Britain, from three, from three months, they was a three-month air battle. The longest aviation battle in military history. Each month, they went from targeting one thing to another. First month, they targeted air bases, anything that they could use to combat their air. And then they decided, oh, one month, it's done. They still have air units what little they have left and decided not to attack them. Instead, they decided to attack buildings, other things, mainly bombing London constantly 24-7 for, for up to four times a day, and pilots would fly up in the air, defend their country, fight for their freedom, come down, have someone take them off the planes, a uh, uh, mechanic hop on the plane, fix whatever was wrong while they were rushed off to a place to sleep and munch on food because they knew in three hours they were getting back in a plane and they were going to fight people because they had very limited amounts of pilots. And you want to know what? Because he decided not to no longer target their air bases or what they could do to defend them off is sort of what screwed them over. And for those of you who are watching this channel for gaming stuff, which I like to do, but I also like to talk about strategies and strategy games, I'll, I'll compare this to a strategy game. This is like you going in with a giant air force in Supreme Commander 2, trying to attack my base, but only going after, say, say my ground forces, but yet my AA going after my, um, going after, like, my shields, my land bases, but yet my air units are defending my base along with my um, anti-air turrets, but yet you don't go after the engineers that are making the air turrets, nor do you going after the air factories that are making the air units as well. Which is also a point, uh, another point of view or another perspective that you have to have. You may not be able to have every single person's perspective in a battlefield. You may not be able to fully understand why an ally is doing what they're doing because they see something you don't. They, they've lived in a different culture, grew up in a different country, and have different ultimate different aspects or different points of view as, as how how they want something done. Maybe beneficial to them and be the most effective way that they can assist you, despite the fact that you may not be able to see that. And you want to know what? That's fine. Another... And... If you combine all of that stuff together, you pretty much get an accurate description of all stuff you need to consider to make a good strategy. So, I, I pretty much went on a bit of a ramble, but I hope you guys enjoy this video. It was also uh, more of a historical lesson as well with talks about that kind of stuff, but if you want to see more of this, let me know in the comment section down below, because here, all different, uh, because everyone's, uh, comments, questions, or feedback is always welcomed. If you have different opinions on, um, different, um, on different things I used or analogies from pieces of military history, feel free to argue with me in the comment section down below. It's okay to have a different opinion. If you want to see a continuation of this scenario, as a strategy guide, or more specifically, this strategy guide, which is World Conquest, the modern one where nations are not fully expanded as an actual strategy guide like I've done in the past, let me know in the comment section down below. Meanwhile, while you're at it, feel free to click on the info cards to subscribe to my channel, see um, other videos on my channel as well, or maybe just check out the playlist of... of, um... Uh, of strategy guide and see all the other things I've done because I've had because I've done strategy on not just video games but actually a few board games going over a few simple techniques that you can use to sort of give yourself an advantage in the game anyway hope you guys enjoyed watching I'll see you guys later bye bye